guys, it's Eric, owner of Farpoint Farms here in the mountains of North Carolina, and today it is finally time to do part two of my base station antenna series. Now in part one, if you haven't seen it, I'll uh, put it right there, we talked about uh, cheap base station antennas, stuff that, uh, you know, the low end, you know, usually four to six feet, and these are just setups like that, or we talked about the, the 102 steel whip, adding a ground plane kit to that and how you can actually make that work, or if you have a steel building or an older mobile home with a steel roof, yeah, you can get away with using a, a car magnetic mount antenna on some of those, but it's not ideal, but, you know, again, that was part one. That's cheap. So today we're going to talk about part two, and that is, you know, pretty much CB antennas for the rest of us. Now, uh, part three, we'll talk about, like, really cool ones, you know, beams, quads, uh, directional antennas, big boy antennas, uh, antennas that get so much gain that it's like having a massive amplifier hooked to your CB. And uh, that stuff's really kind of outside the realm of most casual users. But for those people out there who just want to squeeze out every last little inch of mileage, well, we'll talk about that in part three. And then part four, which should happen sometime early this summer, we'll cover homemade antennas because uh, you can really make some beautiful antennas for yourself and get some great performance out of CB radio with stuff that you can build relatively cheaply. A little bit of wire and a little bit of you know, fiberglass poles, stuff like that. Well, we'll get into that in part four. But again, today we're going to be talking regular base station antennas. And for that, most of the time when you're talking about a regular base antenna for just the average user, you're talking about a, uh, a half wave antenna or uh, there's a 0.64 antenna, there's a 0.58 antenna. But most of the time we're talking about antennas that are going to be from about 16 feet all the way up to about 24, I think is the maximum uh, size they make. And these are going to be ranging in price all the way down from like the low 60s all the way up to probably right around 200 bucks, depending on how you outfit them. And by no means is that cheap, but if you're going to set up a base station, that's pretty much what you're looking at for the average person. The first antenna that comes to mind, and let me just go ahead and show you a picture of it here, is the Antron A99. Uh, now I think it's uh, SolarCon A99, but this antenna ha in one form or another has been around since I got started in this mess and uh, used to be made in the United States. I'm not sure if it still is, to be honest with you, but it's still a good, reliable antenna. Probably the most recognized antenna or the go-to antenna for most guys or gals who are getting ready to start a base station. And for good reason. It's a good performer. It's reliable. It lasts. It's just awesome. Now, I have a video up on mine, and, uh, well, we're going on... One more year, it'll be 20 years that that thing will be up in the air. I took it down to put up a newer base antenna and then ended up putting it back up alongside of it, and uh, it's still working. In fact, the unit in 980 is currently hooked up to it right now, right today. So anyway, that would be your first one. Now, when we think of that, you can get those uh, sometimes on Amazon or on sale. You can get those for like 60, 70 bucks. That's a pretty good deal with free shipping. Now, there's also ground plane kits, and here's a picture of what a ground plane kit looks like. Right now, that adds performance uh, if the antenna is below a certain height, it's supposed to help with it. I will say this about ground planes. I'm no expert. I know the theory of it is to lower the radiator pad, radiating pattern. Let me show you a picture of what a radiating pattern looks like here. Okay, so it's supposed to lower that radiating pattern, which means that more of the signal stays low to the ground and gets out farther. So that's the idea behind it. In practice some people will sell you that the ground plane kit helps a lot and others will say that after they uh, took their antenna down put a ground plane kit on it and put it back up they noticed no real difference so that's buyer beware if you're going to go and start with a regular household your first base antenna i'd probably skip the ground plane uh, up front to be honest with you and just get the regular old a99 this building here has a metal roof and I'm sure it acts as a type of ground plane because it's it's a giant metal surface, a reflective surface. So even though the antenna is a good, I don't know, 20 feet above the roof line, I'm sure that it still has some effect on it. And that could be why I get such good performance with the antennas that I use here. So Antron is probably the first one. The next one up the line, you're talking a Mako 5.8 or Mako 5.8, however it's pronounced. That's an all-aluminum antenna, and it's a great antenna as well. I've never owned one, but I've certainly heard a lot of folks on the radio using them. And here's a picture of one of those right here. And then, of course, you have, and I don't know if they still make these, but you have the Shakespeare and the Shakespeare Big Stick. Here's a picture of the Shakespeare Big Stick, which was also sold by Radio Shack as their Archer uh, base antenna for many years. That was actually the first antenna I had. Again, it was usually, I think, those antennas were like 99 bucks brand new. I got mine used, but it was a great antenna, and I used it for many years. 
And then about the time the first one wore out, I got another used one from a guy who was getting out of the, or moving, I think he was upgrading. But I got it and it was in great shape. It only been up a year or two. And I used that one all the way up until uh, right around 99 or 2000 when I got the Antron. So uh, great, great antenna. I don't know if you can find those new anymore, but if you find a new old stock, it certainly is a good performer. And that's like a baby blue or light green um, fiberglass antenna. And then we move up to a little bit of a larger size, and that would be the IMAX, or now it's called Max 2000. That's also a SolarCon or Antron product. That's currently what I'm using here, and it's just taller. I think it's 20, I believe it's 24 feet, where the uh, regular A99 is 18 feet. So it's a 0.64 wave, as if I'm remembering right, but here it is right here. And again, these all operate on the same principle. It's just the bigger the antenna, you know, the closer to a full wave, the, the better the output, supposedly. But remember, you can't have a full wave antenna the, for reasons that I'm not are beyond me. I, you can't have a full wave antenna. So a full wave would be, what, 32 feet? So, uh, well, no, let's see here, 18, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, huge. So you can't really have that. It just just doesn't work well for reasons that I honestly don't know the answer to but you know your half wave 18 your quarter wave is 9 and uh, so so something like the the max 2000 is about as big as you're going to get for a standard pole dill pole type antenna single pole antenna and then uh, from there you can also make your own and again in part 4 we'll get into it but really if you break down the insides of an Antron or a SolarCon or you know an A99 or a Max when you break it down when you take the fiberglass and shatter it all you're going to find in there is a copper wire that runs from the bottom all the way to the top and a tuning ring to make sure that the SWR ends up being within the right range. So you're not talking about having something that's spectacularly expensive or some secret method to create these things. The ease of it is that if I go out and buy one of these, which is what I've chosen to do over the years, is that generally speaking when you plug them in and get them up in the air, they're already tuned to the 11 meter band or the CB band and they're ready to go, which is why so many people use them. Now the other half of this is, of course, cabling. When I buy an antenna like any of those, and there's others, right? there's a lot of others that I haven't got into, but here's some pictures of different makes and models that are all in the normal price range for a, a normal base station. Or again, not a big boy directional beam set up or anything like that, but just a regular pole antenna base station. Uh, we get into those cables, and let me pause the camera here. I'll go grab a few examples of the type of cabling that you're going to be looking at when you're putting one of these radios in. Okay. So here we go, right? This, this gray wire, hopefully you can see it. I'll get it a little closer there so you can see that. That's RG8 or RG8X, right? It's not bad quality wire. Actually, it's pretty high quality wire. It's got nice end connectors that have been soldered on there. So that's, that's pretty good stuff. I use that actually as a jumper for my SWR meter. But then let's compare it to this. And you can see the thickness difference, okay? if I can get that out. That is RG213. There's also LMR400. So these are these are more insulated, thicker cabling. And again, they're high quality. This one's actually made for outside use. It's shrink tube right there. Soldered ends, of course. So it's a very nice, nice cable here. All right, so these are, these are two examples. So if I'm going to set up a base station and I'm going to put it, say, 35 feet off the ground, which is pretty high up, again, in my tower project last summer, that was the highest I've ever had an antenna at any property I've ever owned. And that's only, uh, I think it's 36 feet, maybe max, maybe 37. So I could probably get away with a 50 foot run of RG8X or RG8, uh, the thin stuff. I wouldn't want to use RG58 or RG59. That stuff just has too much loss. And what loss is, is when the signal's traveling through that center core down that 50 foot of cable, it's how much of it is just going to get lost. It just dissipates through the insulation and gets lost. That also indicates that how long this cable is, if that shielding or that insulation isn't very good, that interference from stuff like this light up here, stuff like electric motors and the refrigerators and stuff like that, how much that radio RF interference is going to get in and affect the signal. The idea here is to have a super low noise floor. As you can see right here, I'm at like 1.5 on the noise floor. And this is, you know, this is with the lights on. I'm not doing anything special. I have the computer on. I have a bunch of stuff running here. So the refrigerator is running or the deep freeze is running over there. So that's pretty darn good, right? If you're plugging this setup in and you use RG59 and it's a 75-foot run, well, you're going to end up with a noise floor that's somewhere around 7, 7 to 9. 
And that's drowning out all those faint signals because the static comes up and the voices that you normally would hear are drowned out by that static. And that's what the noise floor means, by the way, and we'll get into that in another video. But noise floor is the less static you hear, the more voices you're going to be able to hear. The more static you have, the less you're going to be able to hear. That's, that's it bottled up in the simplest way I can describe it. So the advantages is that I have this thicker cabling with a much higher rating of insulation and that means less of this stuff, this interference from all over the place, all that radiation, that less of that's getting in there and less of the signal that's coming from that antenna and headed off to my radio is getting lost as it comes down this. It's not losing that signal and it's not being interfered with by other signals. So that's why the quality of cable and the thickness of the cable and the right brand of cable is what really makes a big difference when we're talking about base station antennas. So that's, uh, I'm trying to make this as simple as possible, but I also want to make it, <laughs> I also want to be clear as to why you're spending the money because you can get 100 feet of this fairly cheap and 100 feet of that other stuff is going to cost you about 100 bucks, maybe 75 if you're lucky, but that's a lot of money. And, and if you're thinking, they're like, I'm only going to spend $65 for my Antron A99, I'm going to stick on my roof, and I'm going to spend $100 in cabling to hook it up to my stereo, or my stereo, my radio. That just seems like crazy, and you're not going to want to spend it. But I'm telling you, you could have a $500 antenna on the roof, and if you got it hooked to your radio with $50 worth of cheapo cabling, you're not going to get the best performance out of that thing. You're going to get interference, you're going to get a lot of background noise, and you're not going to get a great signal, so you're really going to be missing out. So that is pretty much it. You've, we've taken a look at some of these medium-ranged antennas, these antennas that most of us will use. Again, now another cool thing about them, the antennas that I've shown you tonight is that in most subdivisions, who's ever going to notice one of these poles sticking up over your roof line? They're not going to notice it. So if you can't build a tower and you can't put some giant monstrosity on your roof, you can usually get away with one of these because unless you've got somebody who just doesn't like you to begin with, no one's ever going to notice that it's there. And if they do, it's not going to bother them every day. Even in the wintertime, they're not really going to notice that little white antenna sticking up over your roof line. So it really helps that way as well. But anyway, we've already talked about base station installation, so I won't get back into that again as far as proper grounding and all that, but you know you need that stuff. And uh, I'm going to wrap this video up by saying this. For 99% of us out there, and myself included, I will probably never go to a set of quads or a set of uh, in directional antennas where I'm going to be needing an antenna rotor and a massive tower in order to support the weight of this thing. An A99 or a SolarCon Max 2000 or a Mako 5 8 or a Shakespeare Big Stick, those antennas are the bread and butter of the CB hobby, and for good reason. They do a great job of omnidirectional pattern. That means going out in all directions equally and hearing all directions equally. And, uh, and with the right cabling, well, you've got yourself a nice setup. That's it for tonight. I'm Eric, the owner of Farpoint Farms here in the mountains of North Carolina. I hope you enjoyed part two of this video series. And of course, Part three and four will be coming throughout the next few months. We're still working on it. Winter's about, about almost over, about two-thirds of the way over. We've had a little bit of a cold spell again, but that's all right. We'll get it done, and we'll get out there, and we'll start working on part four, where I'll discuss those giant beam antennas that everyone dreams of owning. And part four, well, we'll do some experimenting. Maybe we'll make a base station antenna out of some stuff we have laying around here on the farm, and we'll see how it performs compared to a store-bought one. If you enjoyed the video, I hope you will like and subscribe, and, uh, well... I'll see you next time. Take care. There's always something that needs a little fixing on far point farms. Freedom is mighty sweet. Liberty sows its seed at far.